And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, or Matthew from Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have all treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter, Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the first house that I remember as a child, my mother had a sewing room. And as a little girl, I remember learning very quickly that you had to look at the floor before you step, stepped anywhere. There was, there was a, a carpet, but there were these little pins, right? And then I quickly learned that even when you are looking, you're going to step on something. That's the scripture passage. We can try to avoid getting stuck by it, but eventually you're going to get pricked by the story. The story of the rich young ruler. The story appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels. And, and just so you know, we believe that Mark was written first and that Matthew and Luke had Mark open before them when they wrote their gospels. So they added, subtracted, um, added details that they thought were important that got missed or added details that they thought that their community of faith needed to hear. So, but each of the gospels has its own flavor. But it's funny that we call the story the, uh, the rich young ruler because in Matthew, he's young. In Luke, he's a ruler. In Mark, he's just a man. And in all three, he's rich. And in Mark, he runs to Jesus and kneels before him, which is unusual. And in the gospel of Mark, that usually means that this is a healing story. But it could very well be, right? Not all, feeling, not all healing is physical. And it makes you wonder whether he did not experience some kind of longing, knowing that he was missing something and believing that Jesus could somehow fill the void. His greeting was unusual. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, we believe that that whole good teacher piece was, was flattery. And in that, the folks who know the customs of that time say that when you give a compliment like that, you would expect a compliment back. But Jesus doesn't, he evades. He says, oh, why call me good? No one's good but God alone. Now that's, that's uncomfortable for us to hear. The writer of Hebrews would be like, wait, no, Jesus was perfect. But if you think about it as Jesus just avoiding this whole 
you know, give and take compliment thing, then we don't have to wrestle with it too much. He's just dismissing the compliment rather than returning it. In answer to this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus goes on to list a number of the, com the commandments that are from the 10 commandments, but he adds one. Did you hear it? It jumps out at us. You shall not defraud. Huh. Jesus has something to say about how this man makes his money. The Greek verb could mean not paying someone their due wages, or it could uh, mean refusing to return money that has been given to someone for safekeeping, right? For both economic exploitation. We could go in all sorts of fun directions with this this morning for modern years. How do we apply this, right? We could talk about minimum wage. We could talk about banks charging fees for people who can't keep a, up a minimum balance. I have a, a fond memory of going to, when that first started, I think I was in college and I went to the bank and I'm like, give me my $1.79 now. That's how much I had in that checking account. But that feels more like a minefield than a sewing room floor. So I just gonna point out that Jesus has something to say about how we make our money. Perfectly valid to have those conversations in the church. In response to Jesus's list of the commandments, the man says, teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Now, is he lying? Is he lying to himself? You know, Jewish faith believed that only three people throughout history kept all the commandments. Is he putting himself in, in, with that crowd? And then Jesus says, and don't miss this. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Holy, go, sell, give, come, follow. When he heard this, he was shocked. Literally, the Greek means he was gloomy. And he went away grieving for he had many possessions, which is to say he was a wealthy landowner. Now, this is where everyone squirms, right? Are we all supposed to do that? Is it universal? Or was it that just specific to this man? Jesus didn't turn to the crowd, to, didn't turn to the crowd and say, okay, everybody sell everything that you're on and then come back and follow me. And we can all breathe a sigh of relief. But let's pause and imagine that we are that young man. It is you and I standing before Jesus. What is he asking us to leave behind in order to follow him more fully? Now, I think it would be a really cool question to ask, like communally as a church, what is Jesus asking the church and this church to leave behind in order to follow him more fully? I think that's a great question to ask ourselves, but let's make it individual for the time being. Let's make it personal. What is Jesus asking you to leave behind in order to follow him more fully? What would Jesus, looking at you, loving you, go, give away, come back and follow? It could be stuff, and let's not pretend that that doesn't preach to all of us, that we all don't have love for stuff. I used to dream of not owning anything that I couldn't fit into a backpack. <laughs> but now I have neck issues, so I can hardly lift anything. <laughs> but I remember the first time we bought something big, like a, a washer and a dryer, and that was like a big deal. Like, it doesn't fit in a backpack. Yes, for some of us, it is our attachment to possessions. And, but, and then on top of that, because it's always more than one thing, it could be put down the bottle, put down the credit card, get off the internet, stop sleeping around, close that tab or that window and you know what I'm talking about. Those who know, know. Get help. What do you hide from other people? 
What are the lies that you tell yourself? And can you be proud about how you make your money? What would Jesus sneak into that list of the Ten Commandments just for us? I'm going to invite you to rest with that question. I had a very, very powerful experience uh, two Easter's ago, the first Easter dur during COVID. And if you remember, there was Ash Wednesday and then a couple of weeks later, we, we were in lockdown. And I was still in full-blown cheerleader mode, you know, because at that point it was just six weeks. We got this, right? And knowing how devastated everybody was going to be about not being able to come together for Easter, I tried to figure out a way to make it special. So everything was online and I was recording my sermon. And what I decided to do was film a sunrise. And I live in a, I live in a lake community and I found this gorgeous spot to, to, and the Saturday before Easter was gorgeous, it was perfect, it was a clear morning. And I went out before, uh, before first light and propped, you know, and, and your phone, my phone has a compass, right? So I could figure out which way was east. And I propped my phone up on a rock. And then I sat there with my, with my husband's big winter coat and, and sat down and filmed the, the sunrise. And by the way, I was, you know, I, I taped my sermon, the, an audio tape of it, and then I put it together with the sunrise and, and sped it up so they watched the sunrise while I preached. It was really cool. But anyway, what am I going to do while I'm sitting there? Because normally when you've got nothing to do, what do you do? You play with your phone. But my phone was, was filming. So I thought, oh, Maybe I'll pray. And I asked myself the question, how do I need salvation in my life? And I sat with that question. And the same stuff came up that always comes up, the stuff that I push to the side and try to ignore. But this time, I'm sitting in darkness. And then I experienced the earth come to life. And you know, Emily Dickinson, I'll tell you how the sun rose a ribbon at a time, right? And with the first light, the birds wake up and then the insects and then and the light changes everything and it was magical. And suddenly everything seemed possible. And I resolved to make some changes. That morning, some chains were broken for me on that Easter. That is what Jesus is offering this man to break his chains. I invite you to wrestle with the question, how do you need salvation? Because everything is possible with God. Our scripture passage began with the question, what do I need to do to in inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, nothing, it's a gift. Are you willing to unwrap it? Jesus doesn't promise that life is going to be easy. And I don't know if you caught in that last, when he talked about the blessings, he, he, he also slips in, and there will be persecutions. <laughs> Yay. But again, in, uh, in Mark, we've been reading about the first will be last and the last will be first. Some in this life who will be, our last will be first and others vice versa. So, children of God, Jesus looking at you, loving you, what does he say? I believe you already know. We don't know the end to this man's story. We know what he did that day, but he could have chosen something very different the next day or the day after that. Tomorrow is another day. And so it is for us each and every day to go, get away, come, follow where Jesus leads. All things are possible with God in Jesus' name. Amen.